This little cutie is Hera, and it's due to launch this month to examine the first test of asteroid deflection. This is Didymos, and this is its moon, Dimorphos. On September 26, 2022, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, slammed into Dimorphos at a relative speed of about 6.6 km per second. The reason? To see whether hitting an asteroid was a viable way of changing its trajectory. The European Space Agency's Hera, with a total mission cost of 350 million euros, will reach Dimorphos in October of 2026, two years from now, and four years from when DART hit Dimorphos. You can think of DART as the probe that did the hitting, and Hera as the probe that's going to do the follow-up observation. Didymos and Dimorphos don't pose any threat to us here on Earth, but they are good test dummies for us to try this technology on. While Dimorphos is relatively small, at around 170 by 170 by 120 meters, an asteroid this size is more than large enough to wipe out a city on Earth. By monitoring the brightness of Didymos with telescopes from Earth, we can observe the brightness of the asteroid dipping every time its moon passes in front of it. By comparing this brightness pattern before and after DART's impact, we can see whether Dimorphos's orbital period changed. And it did. It went from 11 hours and 55 minutes to 11 hours and 22 minutes, a decrease of around 5%. Momentum transfer was greater than expected due to the impact blasting out surface material, which created a higher than expected momentum enhancement effect. Determining how strong this effect is was one of DART's main goals. Maybe you're thinking, well, okay, fun's over. What's Hera going to do once it gets there four years after the impact of DART? It's a fair question because ESA's original AIM mission, which was supposed to accompany DART and observe the impact live, was canceled in 2016. In 2017, the Hera mission was created to replace the AIM mission, but it would now arrive late. But even so, because most of what we know about the DART impact is from Earth-based radar and telescope, checking out the aftermath with a probe will still be very valuable. In 2022, the Hubble Space Telescope and some ground telescopes were able to detect a debris tail from the impact, and some data was captured by the lesser-known Lycia Cube spacecraft, the Italian space agency CubeSat, which piggybacked with DART and separated 15 days before impact. But Hera will get a closer and more detailed look. It will image the surface of the asteroid in high detail to examine the crater left by the impact. It will also deploy two CubeSats called Juventus and Milani. Juventus will include a radar with a spatial resolution of 10 to 15 meters to map the internal structure. This is, in my opinion, probably the most important instrument of this mission, and I'll tell you why a bit later. Juventus will also include a gravimeter. Milani will include a hyperspectral imaging instrument to measure the surface composition of the asteroid and a thermogravimeter for detecting dust, volatiles such as water, and light organic materials. Once they've done all they can from orbit, Milani and Juventus will then land on Didymos, and ultimately Hera may land as well, depending on how everything goes. Overall, the goal of Hera is to learn more about the aftermath of the impact and to try to understand whether this is a viable way to deflect an asteroid, as well as gaining a greater understanding of how our solar system was formed by learning about crater creation and collision physics. So why does all of this matter? Well, if a large comet or asteroid hits Earth, it's going to do a lot of damage. I mean, just ask any dinosaur who was around 66 million years ago. The classic line is always the dinosaurs went extinct because they didn't have a space program. If you think that a future where humanity flourishes would be good, then you probably think that anything that threatens that future would be bad. The late philosopher Derek Parfit considered the following three scenarios to illustrate this point. One, peace. Two, a nuclear war that kills 99% of the world's existing population. And three, a nuclear war that kills 100%. Most people would say that Scenario 1 is the best, and Scenario 3 is the worst. But it may be unintuitive that the difference between Scenario 2 and 3 would be much greater than the difference between Scenario 1 and 2, because Scenario 3 would mean the loss of all future human lives with no chance of recovery. Despite the low frequency of asteroid and comet impacts that could end all life, their impact is so high that they still warrant attention, which means finding and tracking them, and thinking about how to deflect them. In fact, in 2007, Jason Matheny, who is now the president and CEO of think tank Rand Corporation, estimated that despite the low probability of an impact on a year-to-year -year basis, asteroid detection and deflection research and development could still save a human life year for $2.50 US due to the expected loss of future generations from extinction. This is pretty good value for money when you compare it to some of the best now-centric human charities. Moving on a little, let's think about how many big asteroids there are that could plausibly hit us. This graph looks a little busy, but it's really quite neat. The x-axis is the number of asteroids over this given size. So number of asteroids over 0.1 kilometers, for example. This follows a power law quite closely. 
The red line is the number of asteroids that we've discovered for each given size. You can see that we think we've discovered nearly all asteroids around one kilometer in size, but for asteroids around 0.1 kilometers in size, we've maybe only discovered about a percent. So maybe we don't need to worry about the dinosaur killer sized asteroids so much, unless they're a long period comet or an extrasolar asteroid. But as we start to get smaller, we start to do a lot worse. And these small asteroids can still do a lot of damage. For example, the Tunguska event involved a small asteroid around 50 meters across, air bursting above Siberia in 1908, which flattened around 2,000 square kilometers of forest. Luckily, Siberia was, and still is, quite uninhabited by humans, but this would have been a not-so-great outcome if it airburst, say, over Sydney. Here is Tunguska on this graph, and we've only discovered around 1% of near-Earth asteroids this size. And the most recent estimates places Tunguska-sized events occurring around once every thousand years. To illustrate this point, I'm going to use this tool to drop an asteroid on Sydney and see how much damage a Tunguska-sized asteroid would do if it hit here today. So if we launch an asteroid here, we've got 200 feet, which is a little bit bigger, but it won't let me get exactly to 160 feet. Uh, stony asteroid, we think. There is some debate about this still. And these are pretty typical uh, impact angle and speeds. So an asteroid this size would probably air burst at around 1.2 miles above the ground. And the explosion would be equivalent to 19 megatons of TNT. An impact this size, as I said, happens around once every thousand years, and this would make it the largest airburst in recorded history. Now, onto the damage. You'll note that an asteroid this size wouldn't cause a crater because it's not hitting the ground, it's bursting in the air. But the shock wave and the wind caused by this will still do a significant amount of damage. So, from the shock wave itself, an estimated 28,000 people would die. And within this area, which is more or less the Sydney Central Business District, and then some, there would be about 99% fatalities. Moving further out, a lot of people would die from the wind, which would be at its peak 2,000 miles per hour. And an estimated 181,000 people across Sydney would die from the wind blast. Trees would be knocked down to quite a large distance. So even though this asteroid wouldn't wipe out all life on Earth or all humans, it would do a lot of damage to whoever lives where it lands. So Hera, teaching us more about asteroid deflection, could still be really valuable, even if we're only worried about the small asteroid impacts, and not just the ones that are large enough to cause an existential threat. There are a few ways that we might try to redirect an asteroid, and I say redirect because, unlike the movies, you don't have to completely vaporize an asteroid or split it in two to stop it from being a threat. You just need to give it a gentle nudge with enough lead time. If you're interested in learning more about the maths and orbital mechanics of asteroid deflection, I made a visualization and explainer video using Spaceflight Simulator, which will be on your screen. Some possible deflection techniques include gravity traction, which involves using the gravity of a spacecraft alongside the asteroid to gently pull it, detonating a nuclear bomb or explosives on or near the asteroid, a kinetic impact, which is what DART tested, landing a rocket or ion thruster on it, pointing it upwards and then applying thrust, releasing a cloud of small particles in the asteroid's path so that when it hits those, it slows down gradually over time, and changing the surface reflectance of part of the asteroid to take advantage of the Yarkovsky effect, which can gradually change the orbit of an asteroid. The effectiveness of different asteroid deflection techniques depends on its internal structure. So ideally, you'd want to know about its internal structure before you try and deflect it. This is true for mining a planetary body as well, but I'm not getting into that in this video. For example, an explosive deflection technique is expected to be about 100 times less effective for a porous asteroid compared to a relatively solid one. The exact effect of this is something that Hera will be trying to determine. We know very little about what structure asteroids have in general, let alone for any specific asteroid. These are some of the proposed models for asteroid structure, but we can't tell the structure of an asteroid just by external observation. And when we look at an individual meteorite that has landed on Earth, we're looking at the strongest samples, because the weakest don't survive atmospheric entry, so it's a biased data set. We're also looking at a small piece in isolation, and this tells us something useful about composition, but less so about structure. This is why the test of the radar mapping tool on Juventus is so important. During my PhD, I was looking at whether seismic could be a useful tool to map the internal structure of different planetary bodies. There are numerous challenges with using seismic in space, with the main one being that you have to land one, or ideally more, receiver probes at different locations on the body, and then have, again, one or ideally more, 
seismic wave source locations using vibrational or kinetic sources. You can't do seismic remotely, but radar mapping doesn't have this problem. If successful, this will be the first time that we've mapped the internal structure of an asteroid. If this technology works, we could do more flybys of asteroids and learn more about what they look like inside without ever having to land on one. HERA is planned to launch on the 7th of October, 2024. So depending on when this video comes out, it'll either be just about to happen or we'll have just missed it. We'll have to wait two years before it gets there and probably some more time before we see preliminary results. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to let YouTube know by liking, commenting, and subscribing. That's it, bye.